I'm going to give some background information now on the, this method that we're using to approximate the best fit for some coefficients. This is going to be very different from the book, and it's more of a statistical or probabilistic point of view, but it gives you some, I think, a better idea of where some of this is coming from and how it was originally developed. So I'll just go over the basic idea of what we're trying to do. We'll talk about a linear model. We'll, then we'll talk, say a little bit about experimental data, talk about the probability associated with the error that you observe, and then talk about how you build a system of equations. And we won't finish that off, and that'll be for a separate video. So the basic idea is this. Um, we have some measurable quantities um, and for that, that correspond to a physical system. Uh, we assume that there's some relationship between them, and that relationship is going to come out of the basic physics or chemistry or biology or whatever uh, discipline you're working in, but you're going to assume some relationship between them. Uh, in this case, we're going to assume a linear relationship, so it's basically a, a um, straight line or a plane or some kind of linear relationship that ties your quantities together you don't necessarily know the slopes associated with the relationship or the intercept and what you want to do is you want to try to approximate what those are based on experimental data so you go and you run your experiment you make a bunch of measurements and we assume that you run the experiment in a uh, efficient way so that means that when every measurement that you make they're all independent of one another so they don't depend on previous measurements uh, we're assuming that you did it in a repeatable, reliable, and accurate way, and that there's no bias that you've introduced into it. Um, and uh, basically what you're, we're assuming is that you're setting up your experiment uh, in terms of some independent variables, and you have a very good measurement, or very accurate measurement, I should say, of those independent variables. But then when you measure the response that you get out of the experiment, some error is going to be made there. And that's going to be the greatest source of, of error in your experiment. And the error itself, we're going to assume, is nice in that it's predictable uh, uh, in terms of its distribution, and it's not skewed or biased in some way. Um, and also, we're going to assume that in your experiment, you make a lot of measurements. So there's going to be many more measurements that you have available to you than unknowns. So once you have that, we're going to uh, try to make some um, determine some relationship between the uh, variables that you have. So we've got independent variables. And so, for example, if you're working in 2D, you'd have x and y would be your independent variables. And then we're going to assume that um, uh, the thing that you're measuring is some function of those. And that new thing is we'll call that z. In this case, uh, it's going to be assumed, this function is going to be assumed to be a linear relationship. So it's going to have some slope associated with each of your independent variables. And then there's going to be some intercept as well. So in the case of 2D, what would you have? You would have z is m1x plus m2y plus b. And then if you run your experiment, you get a bunch of x's and y's. For each set of each x and y that you have, you measure a z. And then you want to try to figure out what is the value of these slopes and this intercepts. Okay? And we're going to assume that each of these m's or each of these slopes and this intercepts are some constant and we want to try to figure out what those constants are or at least approximate what they're going to be okay so the question is how do we get that approximation so if this is what you're after this is what you have are these x's and corresponding z's we want to figure out a way to make an approximation of these slopes So what happens in an experiment? Before you run your experiment, you figure out values for your independent variable. 
and you figure out what are going to give you the best values or your best approximation for your final results that you get out of this in the end. So you want the best approximation possible for your M1, M2, M3 to ML. You have to figure out then what X's then are going to do the best after we go through the procedures we're going to end up talking about. By the way, this is uh, comes from a whole field of study called Design of Experiments. Uh, it's a great class you should be thinking about taking part in because it really uh, is the basis for what you should be doing as an experimentalist. So, and I should say that um, there are people who get PhDs in this and study this very closely and it's a field that's in high demand. So what happens in an experiment? You're going to do N experiments. In the first experiment, you figure out your values that you're going to use for your X's. Right, so again, in 2D, what would you have? You'd have an X1 and a Y1. Then you do the experiment again. And then you have, in that case, you have an X2 and a Y2. Then you do the experiment again. You set up your X3 and your Y3, and you keep doing this. You do this n times. So again, if you were doing this in 2D, you just, you'd have an Xn and a Yn. So you keep doing this for each of your variables. Each time you run the experiment, you measure some response variable that we're calling Z. So you measure your Z1, you measure your Z2, Z3, down to Zn. So now you have n experiments. In each experiment, you're going to have three or however many uh, values. And you want to find the relationship that's going to tie those values together. OK. Um, Oh, and I should say, again, we're assuming that when you set up your experiments, you have a good idea what the X and Y is, right? These may be, for example, uh, concentrations of some chemicals. So you've set up your experiment. Those are measured very well. This value, because of your experimental error, it has more error associated with this than the others. So that value is your main source of uncertainty. So what do we have? We have our original assumption is that z is a linear function of our independent variables. So again, in 2D, we would have the jth experiment would give you the m1 times xj plus m2 times xj. Oops, sorry, that should be the yj. And that's going to be plus the b. The problem here is that when you go and do this, you're not going to get the exact answer. There's going to be some error. Right? So this is not going to be exact. So instead, what happens So in 2D, you would get your equation, but there's going to be some error associated with what you've got here. So this thing is going to be called the error for the jth experiment. And if I solve this equation right, for that variable, I subtract that from both sides, my error in the jth experiment is going to be this thing, is going to be the z minus all of that. And now we're going to need some assumptions then for what we think is going to happen with this. And this is where our independence and all that other other stuff is going to come in. So we're going to assume nice things about this. In particular, what are we going to assume? We're going to, the error that we make in the experiment is going to be independent of each of the other experiments. So when you do one experiment, then do another, and then another, the previous results aren't going to matter. Right? This is a probability issue. We're going to assume that uh, the errors are normally distributed. So that basically means I'm going to have some mean, and the probability that I'm away from the mean is going to be the area under some nice curve. Uh, we're going to assume that there's no bias, so that means the error itself, this mean, is going to be zero, because we're not going to be consistently high or consistently low. And we're going to assume that as you did the experiment, you did the same procedures every single time and were consistent, 
So the variation that we see, or the spread, is going to be the same each time. <clears throat> so the, the jargon we would use to describe this is we'd say it's normally distributed, independent, and identically distributed. All right, so from the normality, so because it's normal, that means that the probability that we make some error, oops, that should be sigma j, sorry, is going to be related to this thing. This is just the probability distribution function associated with a normal probability. And because they're independent, we're going to assume that the total error is going to be the product of the probabilities associated with each of these sigma j's. Okay? So that means I can just multiply this thing for every experiment. So this is experiment 1, experiment 2, experiment 3, all the way down to experiment n. Right? And I can think of this is going to be my sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, this is the error for the nth experiment. Okay, this is a mess. Uh, sorry, that's just unfortunately it's part of the, the uh, part of the situation here. So now, here's what I'm going to do. Let's go back. I'm going to tr my goal here is to find values of these slopes. Notice the these are the same m ones all the way down, same m twos all the way down, same m threes. I want to find values for these m's and the b to make this probability as large as possible. I'm assuming everything uh, went well with the experiment, and I want to figure out values of m's that will give me the greatest probability for having obtained these particular results. All right, so I want to maximize the probability that we would have found these particular values for uh, x1, x2, whatever. So to do that, basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the uh, partial derivatives for each variable and set it equal to 0. This is straight out of Calc 1. Remember in Calc 1, if you want to maximize something, you take a derivative, set it equal to 0. The only difference now is I've got multiple things, so I have to take um, partial derivatives, set equal, each one equal to 0. And what do I have here? I've got a, an equation for each unknown, for each slope, and the um, uh, intercept. Uh, now, if we go back and had all those exponentials, that was a total mess. And we can make it a little bit less of a mess if we take the log of that thing, and then all those exponentials go away, and I'm going to end up subtracting these things. And if we do this, there's a nice geometric way to think about this that we'll go over. But here's the idea is that my value that I measured right, versus my predicted value, right? so given m1, m2, and on out, this right here would be my predicted value Given the values of the dependent or independent variables, that's what I should have found. Now, notice if I take what I found minus what I should have found and I square it, this is always going to be a positive number. And since I'm subtracting everything, everything is going to be negative. If I maximize this, the biggest this thing could be zero. So, ideally, if I found the perfect values for m1, m2 on out, and I made perfect measurements for z1, z2 on out, this would all add up to zero. Okay. Unfortunately, right, there's going to be some errors made. The model's not going to be perfect. There's all kinds of problems here. It's, um, so this will not be zero, but it'll be some negative number. And we want to make that negative number as close to zero as possible. 